Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Lord, we want to thank you for your presence in this place this morning. We thank you for your inhabitation, your habitation in our lives in this place. Yes. Lord, we thank you for your presence today. God, we thank you, um, Lord, that you saw fit to, to come. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, we come this morning, and Lord, we receive your word with gladness today. We receive the things that you want to speak to us and show us and, and the things that you want to, to, to just open our eyes to. Lord, I thank you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. God, you are welcome in this place. And Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would just come and do your perfect work in our lives, in our hearts today. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive the word of God, the truth of the word of God. Our understanding would be open today. Yes. I thank you for revelation today like never before. I thank you, Lord, that we, that we understand who you are in a yes. greater way today, Lord, because of your word and as you're, as you're moving on our hearts today. God, I thank you for anointing our pastor today. I thank you, Lord, for just a fresh and filling for her today. I thank you for strengthening her and encouraging her today. And I thank you for using her to minister your word to us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Woo. Amen. Amen. Woo, thank you, Lord. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, your glory, and your power filling this house. Thank you, Lord. I, I thank you so much for this message. It's been, this is the third part of this message, and hopefully you've been getting my notes, and if you haven't heard all of these messages, try to go back and hear them, but also study the notes. I'm pointing out that Jesus, while he was on earth, today I'm dealing with his ministry, Okay. While he was on earth as a man and his relationship with the Holy Spirit was so significant, significant because he could do nothing apart from him. The title of this whole series is The Significance of the Holy Spirit. According to the gospel writers, Jesus, from the moment the Spirit descended upon him, he became aware of a new power, a power to save, to heal, to bind to st the strong man and overturn his evil work. In Matthew 12, 29, it says, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He became aware of a new authority to teach and to preach. Mark 1, 22 says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, and he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The power and authority to forgive those that had uh, that were captive by sin. Matthew 9, 6 says, But that ye may know that the Son of God hath power on earth to forgive sin. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, go unto thy house. To command unclean spirits to come out of torture that were torturing people. Lucas 4, Luke 4, 36 says, And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For the, with authority and power he command the unclean spirits, and they came out. He knew he was the kingdom of God that was, hand, was at hand, and he declared it in Mark 1.15 and said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and, be, and believe the gospel. Jesus being baptized and going through the wilderness temptation moved him forward into what would be his ministry as a rabbi, as traveling the country, teaching and preaching, gathering disciples to mentor them and to prepare them for their ministries, healing the sick, raising the dead, delivering people from their demonic possession. As I've shared, Jesus was born spirit-filled from birth, nurtured by the Spirit through his youth, enabling him to grow in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit was an instrument in every part of Jesus' mission in developing him and maturing him and preparing him for that mission. And he was enlightened by the Holy Spirit to his unique relationship with the Father. 
I'm going to continue to repeat this and probably will say it at the end of this particular message. The reason that I'm preaching this, the reason that I feel like the Holy Spirit told me to start this message is that we need to understand the significance of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life is so vitally important for us to understand because that is significant in our lives. And I will say this, I'm sure at the end of this message, I have a verse that I will share that will tell you that we are to do the same things Jesus did. If we're to do the same things Jesus did, and we, from the beginning, we were birthed because we, get, we were given birth because of the Holy Spirit. And every part of our lives, the Holy Spirit is very significant in being involved in. It was the Holy Spirit that draws us to the Father. I also shared the Holy Spirit came onto Jesus. It changed his life on earth because he was given an anointing and a power without measure for service. And I keep sharing this scripture because I want you to memorize it. I want you to get it into your understanding and your spirit. And Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And I, you just put your name in there instead of Jesus, and it works just as well. From the moment, from that moment on, when the Holy Spirit ordered the way he was to go and the things that he was to say and the things that he was to do. And I want to tell you, the Holy Ghost wants to do the same thing in your life. He wants to order your steps. He wants to order where you go. He wants to order what you say and what you do. It's very clear that the Holy Spirit is fully motivated Jesus' speech and actions, that the miracles he performed and the words he spoke, he spoke and performed not by the virtue of his own power, the power of his own divine personality, but by the virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit at work within him and through him. Are we getting this? Maybe y'all never, I, I've been so encouraged and so blessed by preparing this message. It's probably blessed me more than it's blessing you. To have a realization of the Holy Spirit in our lives and why, why people like Catherine Kuhlman, Benny Hinn, and many others really acknowledge the Holy Spirit in their ministries because they understood this. They got a hold of it. The need for this relationship to be so close and intimate with him. And it's helping me to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit I've never had before. I'm talking to him. I'm asking him questions. I'm to ask him, well, you know, I can't find something, and I'm asking him where it is. How many of you know he knows where it is? He knows everything. Let me exhort you to understand that we, too, can have the same relationship with the Holy Spirit. And he will work within us and through us as, if, as we submit to his leadership. It just comes down to the realization that we are nothing without him. We can do nothing apart from him. Jesus couldn't either. If Jesus couldn't, then what makes us think we can? Jesus had a reality. As a man on earth, he needed the Holy Spirit. He was an example of who we were and who we are and what we need to live the way he did. Yes, he was God, but I'm telling you, he was operating by the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all don't want to miss next week. Or the, well, Pastor Chris will be preaching next week. Don't miss the 24th. That's my favorite number. It's going to be awesome, I'm telling you. When I preach on Jesus' involvement, I mean, the involvement of the Holy Spirit, the significance in his death and resurrection. Woo, you're going to get excited. There is no way I could share everything that Jesus did in his ministry. But let's look at the verse, some verses that describe a lot of what he did. And I'm actually going to read a lot of Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 14. And, re and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, be being glorified of all. 
And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is come upon me, because he hath anointed me. See, even Jesus knew where his power, where his authority was coming from. Upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He preached deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set liberty them that are bruised. And can I say right here what Jesus is saying about himself, I'm saying to, about you. You have been anointed to do the same thing that he did, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the ministers and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious word which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physicians heal themselves. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in this thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. How many of us know that's the truth? That when you start moving in the things of God and, and trying to win your family and your friends, and, you know, and many of them won't accept it, just pray for them. God will bring other laborers into their life. But I tell you this truth. Many widows were in Israel in the day of Elias when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine and throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Saperta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman of Sierra. Forgive my, my, preach, my pronouncing these crazy words. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him onto the borrow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went his way. And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath day. And they were astonished at his doctrine. And the words was, the, was with power. I'm trying to let you know that in, this, in these scriptures, everything that Jesus did, you can do as well. That's my purpose in reading the whole thing. And in the synagogue where there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? And Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. How many of you have been around people, when you get near them, they go berserkal? They start, they get angry, they don't want anything to do with you, they get mad, they cuss you out. Guess why? They did it to him. And they're doing it to you because he's in you. And Jesus rebuked them, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. Let me tell you something. I, somebody sent me, no one in this church, this video of someone that um, was being baptized. And they absolutely manifested and started going berserko, acting like, you know, the devil was really fighting and everything. And as I watched it, I was like, let me tell you something. We have all power and authority over the enemy. And I wrote back to the person who sent it to me and said, it should have never taken them that long. But they didn't bind it. They don't, if people don't know what they're doing, you can fight all day with the enemy, but if you haven't bound it and commanded it to come out, it's going to stay. Okay? So there's certain things that you do learn about deliverance and ministry 
that you need to be aware of before you start doing it. But I want to tell you, we have all power and authority, and the devil has no right. I can be honest, and I'll be real honest. I'll tell on myself. When, uh, <laughs> when I first came to Pastor Don's church, and, and Jamie, you'll remember this, there was a woman there who had been actually thrown out of another church because she was like a zombie. Her husband would bring her and her children, and they would, she would just sit there. She wouldn't say anything. She just looked straight ahead, and you could tell she was under demon possession. So I remember going to Pastor Don. He was such a sweetheart, you know, and he was so peaceful, and he didn't want to stir up anything. Many of you don't know, remember him being like that because he became a very powerful man of God. But back in those days, I, I went to him, and I said, Pastor, uh, why don't we do deliverance on her? He said, oh, well, her husband's taking care of it, <laughs> taking care of it. And I went, okay. So this was the first time, and the Lord told me he was going to teach me about Satan and his kingdom and how to deal with him long before that. And so I already had a little bit of knowledge, but not a whole lot, okay, not enough to, to really get it taken care of like we should have. But I came into the church. That's when we were in the ice house over there on Hunt Lane. And uh, I walked past her, and she came on me like a, like, a, like a cat. I mean, but like a lion, just, you know, an evil one trying to take me out. And I grabbed her hands because she was coming at me like she was going to scratch me. And when I grabbed her, her, arm, her hands, we went down to the floor. Pastor came up, and I said, do we do it now? <laughs> you know? She's manifesting, Pastor, we need to do something here, okay? And I don't know, Jamie, if you remember this, but five hours I was on the floor with her. And it wasn't just me. We, there was a bunch of us around her trying to deal with her. Because, you know, I didn't realize all the power and authority that I had to deal with this and how to deal with it. And so, but, you know, God uses everything. And she was manifesting in all kinds of crazy ways and everything and um, trying to get up, and, and we just didn't fall for all the stuff she was saying. She gets delivered after five hours, right? After she gets delivered and became okay and was acting normal and everything was great, they left and went back to the church that kicked them out. Don't ever do that. Don't ever go back to a church who wouldn't minister to you or help you do what needed to be done and leave the one that did. But anyway, it was that particular situation that drew me to question and ask the Lord, why did it take five hours? And that was the beginning of the Holy Spirit teaching me, and he began to show me, the strong man. He took me through the scriptures and said, if you don't deal with the strong man and bind him first, you cannot deal with the demons that are operating under him. We could be calling that demon out all day long, but if you don't deal with that strong man, and I began to learn, and he showed me, and all of you that have been through the school and you, you know the 13 that God showed me that are scriptural, I didn't make them up. They're in the scripture about the strong men that are there over the demons. For instance, like heaviness is a strong man over depression and discouragement, okay? Uh, lying is a spirit, a strong man over, are you ready? Profanity, amen, deception, all this kind of stuff. So there's those strong men. And so that's, that whole episode taught me how to deal with spirit. I never spent five hours doing deliverance again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Now we just want the presence of God to deliver us. Amen. And they were all, verse 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What word is this? For the authority and the power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. 
And immediately she rose and ministered unto them. I can't wait till we immediately see cancer leave and fevers leave and sickness leave of all kinds. Amen? Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick and diverse diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on everyone and healed them. And the devil also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. How many of you know the devil knows? He knows the word. Amen? And I've seen him use the word in people who didn't, the enemy was trying to keep me from doing deliverance on them. Because they were trying to say, well, you know, they got the Lord, and if they've got the Lord, they don't have a demon. But I'm going to tell you right now, you can be filled with the Spirit of God and the power of God and still have a demon operating in you. And that's a whole nother subject. And when it was day, he departed and went into the desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed with him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for therefore I am sent. And he preached in the synagogue of Galilee. There is nothing that I'm sharing today, and many of us know about the miracles. Many of us know about everything that Jesus did. The point is, is that we need to realize that if he did it, we can too. But we have to come to a place where we understand the power and the authority we have to get it done. Okay? And so... I know some of you may be struggling with what I just said about uh, you can have a devil as well as being filled with the Spirit of God. I am just know because of the experience that I went through. When I first married Pastor Don, and there was a lot of history that I'm not going to get into, but I was praying for people, laying hands on them, laid hands on someone whose arm was broken, and God fixed it right there, and then I would get home, and I would be pinned to the floor, and a devil trying to keep me from moving or doing what I needed to do. I learned the hard way that this is real. And if God hadn't allowed that to happen and teach me, then there would be Christians walking around that have a devil that I would not even address because, well, they're a, past, they're, a, they're a man or a woman of God. How many pastors do you know that were powerful preachers, powerful ministers, anointed, but end up falling because they had a spirit they never acknowledged or dealt with? Think about that. A man of God who starts out right and he goes and has an affair? Or men of God who end up killing themselves because they were doing drugs? I mean, all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's the saddest thing because there's denominations out there that if you were to come to, I won't mention the particular denomination or word, but there was one pastor that I know of who knew he had a devil, knew that he was um, not doing right, but if he went to his denomination and told him, they would have kicked him out of pastoring. And he had a very large church and a very big ministry. How sad. And the way we developed this ministry, Pastor Don and I, we, we had a concern for our, our pastors and our leaders. What are you standing up for? What? Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? He was a, God, he was a man after God's own heart. You can be a man or a woman of God after his own heart, but he's out to destroy you because of that. You've got to understand. And when Pastor Don and I developed this school and, and the ministers, how many of you are five-fold ministers in this house? Stand up. Went through the school, you're ordained and licensed. Or you, all of you are ordained at this point. Amen. So you can sit down. But you know what? We're here for you guys. Pastor Don and I were here. We laid our lives down for y'all. We're going to say, we're going to keep an eye on you. I'm going to go up to Bobby and tell him, Bobby, I can see something on you we need to deal with because if you don't deal with it, it's going to take you out. And he knows my heart, and he knows that I've laid my life down for him. He's not going to get mad. He's going to say, thank you, Pastor. This is what I've always told them. Because none of us, I was literally paralyzed by a devil, a devil while I was anointed and still ministering. And had we not gone through the process of what the Lord took us through to get rid of this thing and showed us, what happened? A door was open that was not closed. And when you close that door and it's gone, then you can get rid of that devil. And I didn't even open the door. 
It was a previous situation before I married him. But I was called a prophetic intercessor. Yeah, what was that? A prophetic intercessor is somebody who prays out, and I did, things that were in this ministry that needed to be gotten out in order for him to fulfill his destiny and his calling and for me to go on and fulfill what I've done. We had to clean the foundation of the ministry. There were so many things God led us to do, and I learned it the hard way because of what I went through. So don't ever condemn someone who will come to you and say, Pastor, I would never, ever. I have such admiration and such love for every one of you. If you come to me and you say, Pastor, I'm dealing with pornography. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. I'm dealing, I will help you. And we will deal with it because it's a devil spirit that is trying to destroy you, your marriage, and your ministry. Let's not be ignorant of how the enemy comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. And he has the loss. He's after you. That's not in my notes, guys. So aren't you glad you came to church to hear that? The significance of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life was so evident in all that he did in his ministry. I'm going to mention his miracles, and then I'm going to end, okay? I'm not going to, we're not going to look at it. Don't, guys, I didn't give you the scriptures for it, um, so don't worry about that. I'm just going to quickly go through some of the miracles that he did to remind you that you can do the same things. He was born as a virgin in Luke 1. He changed water into wine in John 2. He was healing a royal officer's son in John 4. He cleansed the lepers in Matthew 8. Healing of the centurion servant who was sick with palsy in Matthew 8. Healing of Peter's mother-in-law in Mark 1. He raised the widow's son from the dead, Luke 7. Come on, do you believe you have enough power and authority inside of you to raise the dead? I know there's some you say, just leave them. <laughs> Don't raise them. <laughs> what was that joke? What was that joke about that, that man who's, who's uh, in Israel with his wife and, and mother-in-law, and the mother-in-law dies, and, and they said, well, if you bury her here, it's only going to cost $500. But if you send her back to the States, it'll cost $5,000. He said, I'm paying the $5,000. He says, why? He said, because I know of a man who was raised from the dead staying in Israel. That's bad, right? <laughs> he calmed the storm in Matthew 8, catching a large number of fish in Luke 5. Isn't that great in The Chosen when they're catching all those fish? I love The Chosen. I'm watching a lot. Cursed two de uh, he cursed two demoniacs in Matthew 8. He cur he I'm sorry, he cured, not cursed them. He cured them. He cured... The paralytic in, my, in Matthew 9. He raised the ruler's daughter from the dead in Matthew 9, healing the woman with an issue of blood for 12 years in Luke 8. He was healing a withered hand in Matthew 12. He delivered the healing and healed a demon-possessed man that was blind and mute in Matthew 12. He delivered a man possessed by a legion of demons in Mark 5, healing two blind men in Matthew 9, healing a mute de uh, demon-possessed man in Matthew 9, healing a 38-year in invalid by the pool of Bethesda in John 5, feeding the 5,000 and their families in Matthew, 5, uh, Matthew 14. He healed a woman in Cain in Matthew 15. He walked on water in Matthew 14. He caused the fig tree to wither in Matthew 21. And let me just say here, if God tells you to walk on water, you can do it. But if he doesn't tell you, don't be stupid because you'll fall right down in the water. Amen. He also fed 4,000 men and their families in Matthew 15. He healed a blind man in Mark 8. He's healing a man born blind in John 9. He delivered a demon-possessed boy in Matthew 17. Catching a fish with a coin in his mouth. Don't you love that one? So what makes you think God can't provide your needs? Any way he wants. Amen? 
in Matthew 17. Healed a woman with an 18-year crippling infirmity in Luke 13. Healing a man that had the dropsies in Luke 14. Healing 10 lepers in Luke 17. Raising Lazarus from the dead in John 11. Restoring an ear of a servant. The Roman soldier, remember, that came to get him, that Simon Peter cut his ear off. In Luke 22, he, and then the catching of 153 fish in John 21. That's all I'm going to share. As I conclude this part about Jesus' ministry and the significance of the Holy Spirit was in every miracle that he did, let me remind you what Jesus said in John 14, 12. Verily, verily, this is my favorite scripture. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. If you have ever asked, how is this possible? Well, now you know. If you lean on or depend on or have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, and he becomes significant in your life, you too can do the same things that Jesus did. But you know what? You have to believe that. Don't for one minute say, well, how many of you have ever said, I remember when I got saved and I wanted to get, I wanted to have the gift of tongues. And it just wasn't coming. And one night, and this happened at home by myself, I said, Lord, is it that I'm not worthy? Boy, did God rebuke me. Don't ever say that he's not worthy, that you're not worthy. He died for you. He suffered and died. And oh, my word, when you hear next time I preach, when you realize what he did for you, you're worthy. The worst sinner on this earth is worthy. You're worthy. He says, abide in me and I'll abide in you. And he says, when you ask me to come into your heart, I come and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if he is there, he's just waiting on you to use him, to let him use you. We don't use him. He uses us. But if you don't have confidence that he will use you, he won't. Don't ever hesitate when he tells you to do something. The results are in his hands, not yours. He said, but I prayed for somebody and they died. Keep praying for somebody that's healed. And, and you'll see the healings happen. Not everybody I've prayed for has been healed, but many have. Many. Even this year, we've seen people not only healed of cancer and, and off of their deathbeds coming alive and, and being able to function and, and everything been disappeared. I believe. I believe. And Holy Spirit, may everyone in this room begin to believe who they are and who dwells in us. We're not wanting to do this. Now, listen, we've got to make sure our hearts are right. I'm not doing this so everybody knows my name. I'm not doing this because I want everybody to know our church. When we went to Africa, nobody knew our names. And we didn't go there wanting everybody to know our names. Because they could kill us. They didn't want us there. But I can tell you they knew who Jesus was when we got through. And that's our purpose. We want to win souls, and we want people to know Jesus. They don't care. We don't want them to know us. But we want to be available. And we don't put demands on him. We don't say, I want to do this, and I want to do that. I will say this. I did tell the Lord a long time ago, I want it all. I don't want to be limited that some can get this gift or that gift. I want it all. And I believe we can have it all. Because if he's in me, I have it all. And I'm just going to be available. Whatever he wants me to do, I'll do it. There's nothing that I do in this church because I want to do it or I think we should do it or because others tell me to do it. I do what he 
tells me to do. And didn't Jesus say that? I do what I see my Father do. What he tells me to do is that's what I do. We need to be the same way. And not just about our church, but our family, our relationships, our jobs. Whatever is a part of our lives, we need to submit it to him and allow him to do what he wants to do. Because I'm going to tell you what, you're hindering what God wants to do for you. You're hindering the blessings. You're hindering the the provision. All that he wants to do for you and for your family, you're hindering it because you keep telling him what he ought to do and how he ought to do it. Don't pray prayers like that. Thy will be done. Lord, you know my heart. I want my family saved, but I trust you to do it however you want to do it. But when you start telling him what to do, he's going to back off and let you just keep on praying those prayers and ain't nothing going to happen. We have to trust God. See, when I heard this morning the internet was out, I slapped myself because I knew the internet was out when I saw the cameras go out this week. But I wasn't, I didn't call, when I called Chris to tell him, I didn't say, Chris, our internet's out. But when I was driving here this morning, I felt the internet was out for a priest. If for nothing else, it got Mark and Charbonnet here. Because they were, they were not coming because of what happened earlier this morning, choking and calling EMS and all that. But when I sent them, I called you, didn't I? I actually called him this morning and said, Mark, we're not going to be online. Next thing I know, here they are. And I'm so glad you came. There's things that God wanted to do that we didn't need to have online. Thank you, Holy Spirit. you got to trust him. You can't get upset and mad because they cut the wire. Hey, whatever's happening, God has, what even if the devil did it and mean it for bad, God can use it for his glory. Amen? Amen? Thank God. Your family's okay. Whoever heard of a trailer and truck? Flipping all those times, and everybody's okay. Come on now. Trust him with your lives. Trust him with your family. Do it his way, not yours. You're never going to be able to accomplish what you want to do on your own. There's things you may be going through, things that you have going on in your life, that without him, you cannot do it. Stop looking at the past. Stop looking at what happened in the past and thinking, well, it just, it can't happen. John, it can happen. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I'm telling you. Don't you know that God can do more in one second than you can do in years? He's appearing to Muslims, and they're getting saved. You can talk all day long to Jehovah Witnesses and Muslims, and they're not going to do anything. But when they have an encounter with God, let the Holy Spirit teach us how to pray. Let's pray his way and watch what he does. Trust him no matter what. Amen? Holy Spirit, I thank you for these messages. I thank you you're teaching us what you could be in our lives if we'll allow you. Thank you for convicting us. And we repent right now when we've been trying to handle it on our own and do things the way we want it done. And we're just trusting you to do it. And we give you, and I love that song, you are worthy and we give to you all the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can we praise him this morning?